At this time, would we please stand and we will also dismiss the children to a children's church. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. I then obeyed his blessed commands and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. You may be seated. I'm back. <clears throat> so, you know, when, when movie studios make a movie and the first one is just great and it's a blockbuster, and then they make it, well, they make a movie and it does okay, and then they go to make a sequel, and then we go see it and we're like, eh. Well, I ho hopefully that doesn't turn out to be the case. Not, I don't know that last week was a blockbuster, but anyway, my point was, you know, I get, I, it's funny, I've got more butterflies today than I did last week, which is kind of weird after not having preached for literally years. So last week, if you're here, we covered what the prosperity gospel is out there in the religious world and why it's no gospel at all. And biblically, biblically we, we looked at how it's, it's a major misuse of scripture. Um, and, you know, I, I did that on the purpose of contrasting the real and true prosperity that we have in Christ. And, you know, I just thought the song Cameron led there, which I know we're in the same house, but I, I, I didn't pick the songs. But, you know, I could also, you could also call this lesson, which is called The Real Prosperity Gospel Part 2, you could call it Victory in Jesus. But then you would have thought I was just going to pick apart the verses of the song. But it's, it's, it's really very clear. So let me see if this thing works. I had to get the batteries replaced. It ran down. Okay, the Real Prosperity Gospel Part 2. So the four things we looked at real quick in recap was we looked at that it is not the prosperity gospel. will tell you what prosperity is, but prosperity is not. It's not health, wealth, and power. Um, although, as Jerry did a great job of explaining just a minute ago, you know, it's not wrong to have those things, but that's not what it is when it's prosperity biblically. It's also not name it or claim it. It's also not that, you know, not that you don't have because you don't ask kind of thing, the misuse of scripture that's, that's used for that, where they, well, just name it and claim it. You don't have it because you just didn't ask God to give you that health, wealth, and, and power. Um, it's also not... Whatever one sows, that he will also reap, you know, by giving more 
dollars to such and such ministry. Um, that if you give big money, you get material stuff from God. And the, we looked at the Galatians, the verse in Galatians uh, uh, about how we treat others. It's really about how we treat others. It's what's even in the context there. It's not even about wealth, health, and power. And lastly, we covered that it was not the ver it's not a verse there using out of Galatians 3.13 and 14a. Christ redeemed us uh, so that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Um, in context, in the context, Galatians 3.13 and 14 used uh, by Paul there say clearly that the blessing is the promise of the Spirit. And, that, and that's what we get, not material things. And that's our salvation that came down through all that time that God was working on that from before time, right? And all the way down through Abraham and all the way down to us. So then we turned to real prosperity and started with the preview of coming attractions by looking at Jeremiah 29, which says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And so the, the real prosperity being the hope and a future is one of those ways we prosper in Christ. Um, now, we're not or at least don't have to be like the world around us who lack a worthwhile or maybe not even any hope in the future, right? I mean, think about the fact that's why it's such a great blessing because if you think about it as a Christian, there's something that you believe and you have a hope in the future and we're not like the world around us you know, which the world around us is like this, you know, like, like the, this little kind of derpy-eyed dog, you know, just sitting in the flames like, yeah, this is fine, you know, and just trying to, be, trying to be comfortable in a miserable situation. The prosperity of hope and future was just a teaser, though. It was just the lead-in to all the real great prosperities that I wanted to share with you uh, of being a follower of Jesus that we get, and I'm going to try to get to a bunch today. Um, and, and I believe that God had put this on my heart as was reflected in the, the uh, scripture reading that Stan read for us there, Philemon 4, 6. Uh, those, Philemon is one, one book, only has one chapter, so it's Philemon 4 through 6. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. You know, as an elder, you know, I want to help you with anything I can to make your Christian life work, right? I, I, want, I, don't, I want to try to get things out of your path. I want, I want you to be able to get the most that you can out of your walk with God. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and if it is, and it's working, then you're glad the decision you made, you know, because you say, hey, it's working. And if that's happening, then you're a happier Christian. And when you're a happier being a Christian, then, then you're happier and more excited about getting to share what you have with others. I mean, if you're not, and if, because if you're not happy about it and it's not working for you, then, then it's not, right? But before we go and look at a bunch of scriptures here, I need to, I need to check something with you. So I want to make sure, I want you to ask yourself real quick, do you really believe what the Bible says? I mean, when it says it, you're like, the Bible says it, what, what is it, what's that saying go? The Bible says it, that said it. God said it, that settles it, right? Something like that. Do, we, do you really believe that? Okay, because if you don't, then these amazing verses in the Bible that are there and they're clear and they're clear in context, they're going to be just like you like some nice saying you see that your friends on Facebook post that's some kind of feel good, you know, uh, power of attraction, power of positive thinking thing that scrolls by on the social media. It's just going to be like that, and, and it's not. It's, it's from the Bible. It's what we're going to look at. Um, but if you do have a little bit of trouble believing that the Bible is God's word, um, and you're, sure you're still coming to that faith, or you're not sure that you really believe it's, it's God's, you know, unadulterated, kept down through all the time word, then, then just for a few minutes, that says they say, suspend your unbelief. Just, just pretend you believe for a little bit. And let's see, see what the word does. Let it work. Let it in. Okay, so let's get to it. Okay, one of the things that you have when you, when, when the real prosperity gospel is you have freedom from the imprisonment, blindness, and slavery to your sin. 
okay? Luke 4, 16 through 21, it's kind of a long passage here, but it says, it's about Jesus here. He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, so picture that in your, the theater of your mind for a moment which is what I do, and so I just kind of, yeah, I don't know what the inside of a first century synagogue really looked like, so in my mind, it kind of like, kind of looks like this, right? And so, so they come in, you know, maybe the carpet was a different color, but you know, so they come in, and they come in, they're all sitting down, and then it's time for Jesus, it's time for somebody to come up and read the scripture. And so, Jesus gets up, and he, he stands up to go step up to the lectern here to read, and the person hands him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And I can always wonder, wow, can they just hand them anything, you know? And then, but anyway, no matter whether it was that, whether that was what was planned or not, he opens it up and it's a scroll, right? So he's got a roll and he scrolls to this part that's like in Isaiah 61. And he reads that passage. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolls it back up. And he goes, and he sits down. And it says the eyes of everybody were fixed on him. That's what I think is kind of funny. You know, it's like, what does that mean, you know? And they're like, what, why did you read that, teacher? Why did you read that? And then that's when he says, oh, yeah, that's me. And, and that's what's amazing about it. That's what's so cool about it. So the people Isaiah was talking to, in Isaiah 61, back in 700 BC, we're told, we're being told a prophecy about Jesus coming later. About Jesus, because this was about Jesus, and that like 700 years later or so, Jesus is going to come on, and he's going, and right here he goes, okay, that's an old teaching, and now it's an old teaching about somebody who's here, and now it's here. It's here. This good news, this proclaim, this freedom, this sight for the blind, this being free from your oppression. He's going, this is here for you people right now. Now, here we are reading this verse, like we can read in our own Bibles because we're so blessed to have the ability to do so on our own, that we're just like them, you know, because they were, because they were, so just like them, we are, we were, we are, are, are a prisoner and oppressed by our sinful mistakes, our sinful practices, our, our bad choices. We're also blind, like, they, like, like he was talking about, and, and need to receive sight, need to get our sight recovered, because we're blind to the truth and the darkness of our own feelings, our own opinions about everything. And lastly, well, also, then we're oppressed, and we're limited in our ability. I think of oppressed like being unable to blossom into who God really wants me to be because, because of my self-destroying practices in my sin. But now, we live on this side of Jesus. I mean, even better than the Jews that were sitting there right then in the synagogue, we've got it even better than them because they didn't even know what was going to happen with the death, burial, and resurrection. We're on the other side of, of Jesus' resurrection, and we have freedom so that we're no longer a prisoner to our sins against God. And if we were blinded to our sin and couldn't see where we needed to go and what we needed to do or unable to accept the Bible, unaccept the truth, we can now see. And if we were oppressed and we were enslaved by sin, keeping from us from being a useful human being or useful to God in a purpose, now that's really prospering. Now that's what we really got to do. And we live in this year of the Lord's favor. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't study what that really may possibly mean. There could be many meanings or many opinions about what it means. But the year of the Lord's favor, well, whatever it is, it's Better to be in the year of the Lord's favor than his unfavor, right? Okay. So that's where we are. And so when we look at the things that that verse promises, it's like, and Jesus is saying there, it's like, fly, be free. 
I'm not, I don't have to be, I don't have to be enslaved to those things anymore. Okay, let's look at another one. We're just getting started. Okay, so you have freedom from enslaving sin, recovery of sight from the blindness to truth, freedom from the oppression of sin holding you back, and enjoyment of the year of the Lord's favor. Because I, I forgot to go to that script, that, to that slide. You have peace that transcends all understanding. Okay. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I've always liked that verse. It's a comforting verse. But I thought, you know, it's, it's a little wordy. You know, it's a little Paul. Paul can do these long run-on sentences and things. So I looked at them, just a different version. And so I found the message version. It's a, it's a paraphrase. But read with me this, what it says. This is what it says. This is how it tries to put in more feely words, if you will. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. You gotta love that. It's just a great wording. You know, as a Christian, you have peace at your beck and call. I mean, peace is just right there. It's it's it says so. Here, here's one of those places you gotta go. Do I believe? What the Bible says? Do, do I believe that when I'm tempted to worry? Do I handle it like that? But anyway, I'll save those questions for you. I have for later. Um, and so, you know, if not, Paul's a big fat liar. If not, the Bible's not true. He says that it's a non-understandable peace that guards your heart and your mind when you pray about those situations. But he's no hypocrite, you know, no power of positive thinking mind guru. I mean, he, that he, he, he actually had to struggle with it himself. Look, 2 Timothy 1, 12. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I believed and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. He practiced what he preached, you know. He trusted God and he, he set those things on God's desk, right? So... Paul, at this time that he even wrote this to Timothy, was in prison for teaching about the life of Jesus and believing in him. And, and so he, that didn't make him a, a hypocrite, you know, telling that them they have some peace they didn't. But what he was telling them is because they can take those, those concerns and those things that are weighing on them or the things they're really tempted to worry about, and they can just take them and go, man, this, I'm carrying this burden around, I'm tempted to worry about, and they can come up to dad's, God's, you know, big desk up there and just kind of set it up there on his desk in his end basket and go, can you please take care of that? And that's what happens. And you can leave it right there and let him take care of that worry. <clears throat> um, oop, I want to go say one more thing. Um, it, it works for me. I, I do that sometimes when I feel overwhelmed with things. I will just pray like that. I'll just go... God, I don't know what's going I'm afraid this might not turn out well. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to say, well, I just pray I'm just going to, I like will literally do that with my hands. You know, I'm just going to set this up here on your desk and please help me take care of it, you know. And, um, you know, I had a few days or maybe it was weeks um, during that very bad chemo reaction where I look back and I know that there were, I, I don't know why I wasn't freaking out really badly because I wasn't sure I was going to get better or things were going to stop going the wrong way and some numbers. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm just that out of touch with my feelings or maybe, or well, I'm just going to say that was that piece that I didn't understand. I don't really know. Um, otherwise, I don't have another explanation for it. But try it. We have a purpose. <clears throat> Exodus 9.16 says, But I've raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Oops, how'd that get in there? That's about Pharaoh. Anybody get that? That's the wrong purpose to have. Pharaoh is a cautionary tale about your purpose. And God did have a purpose for him, but he was going to kind of make an example out of him, not, and not in a good way. But 
if you're an over busy parent or guardian and I say, well, you've got a purpose, and you immediately think of all kinds of work, church works and things like that, right? And the interesting thing about that, or, you know, you, you don't ha you're like, where do I have time to fulfill a spiritual, religious, church participating, whatever? You may feel like your purpose is just to make it from one day to the next. It may just be enough to get these kids through their homework and baths and get them to bed and collapse yourself, you know. But I, I, I want to make sure we have the right perspective on that. So, so think about, so sure, your life is full of all those things, and that can be a challenge, uh, can really be a challenge there. But purpose is a little different than you have a big long list of tasks or a bunch of churchy actions you're supposed to do to, to, to be considered having a purpose. I'm going to step into pop iconism for a second. Uh, to get a little perspective, right, so this is Iron Man, Tony Stark, right, from the Marvel Comics Cinematic Universe. And he was a millionaire playboy philanthropist was the way he described himself. Rich, playboy, but also, also doing good things for the earth. And now his problem was he had everything he could want to do something with. You know, he had brains, money, things. He had the big three, sex, money, and power. But he was still miserable and tortured inside by his shortcomings and his selfishness. And the, so I heard somebody say that the problem with his character in the movies was that he has everything to live with and nothing to live for. And so it's, the purpose is about having something to live for. Now, fortunately, through the arc of the development of his character through the Avengers movies and whatnot, and his, the Iron Man movies and things, he ends up becoming a little less selfish. And as you kind of know how that all ends in the end games, those kind of things that, you know, he ultimately he makes his sacrifice. He sacrifices his life for other Avengers and for mankind, <laughs> which is great, but yet it's still not saving souls, what he does. And, but he's only saving humans from dying randomly, right? But he has, you know, the thing was, the example of his life is if you think of him at the beginning of those movies, if you're into those, is that he really just totally lives for himself. And it's all to show off what he is and what he does and what he has. But at the end, he does become a person who has more of a purpose. He's really become more of a, of a people lover. So, I digress. So any, even when you feel your life is too busy to be about a purpose of a set, a set group of actions that you think, you know, show you look so Christian-y, you still have that purpose. You have that purpose because you decided to follow Jesus. And there's a security in that. There's a security that you have a direction that you go in, in the decisions that you make, in the actions that you actually take that may save you, that could save you, think of it this way, from despairing of life. There's so many out there we hear about today who take their own lives because they don't have a direction. They don't have a purpose. Or they go and take other people's lives needlessly. Some of these, you know, massacres that happen are just that are so dreadful. They don't they don't have there's there's a purpose that they don't have. And what we have, Christian, is we have a purpose. And we have it in spades if I may use a, a bridge game analogy in church. But so, or, or let's say we have it in abundance. We have purpose, we have a ton of purpose. You have more purpose than, you know, I can do. Okay, so for instance, let's look at these verses about your purpose when you're a Christian, there's a lot. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good thing, good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hey, to do good works, well, yeah. I know. I said, you may not be able to do those things, but you, you have that purpose to be able to do good works that God has prepared for you to do. And if you're a super busy parent and you don't know your, your goal is just to get to the end of each day and collapse your head on your bed, the decisions you're making, the actions you're taking with raising those in the things you do throughout the day are part of your purpose. Those are your disciples. Those are your little disciples, if you will. Those are who you're raising, trying to help know about Jesus and know about God. Okay? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Purpose? Honor God with your bodies. 
And the Bible even gets more specific in how what that, that looks like with some other scriptures like these. Where our purpose is to remain in Jesus, John 15, 5. To bear much fruit, which glorifies God, John 15, 8. To grow in the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Now I've got some of you singing that in your head. To kill, well, that doesn't sound like a good thing, but to put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil de desires and greed, which is to idolatry. And it goes on. To go and make disciples, Acts 8, 4. Those who'd been scattered did what? Preach the word wherever they went. That was their purpose. To, next one, to bring praise to God by accepting each other, Romans 15, 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. To love one another, John 13, 34, and 35. To take care of the widows and the orphans, James 1, 27, that says, Religion that our God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world, and to pray. And I'm sure I just missed, you know, tons of them. But I mean, but that's, that's just without even looking hard, right? Yep, some of that sounds like work. But it's good works, and it's works that go a direction. It's works that help, help, help me to, yeah, stay on the right path. Works that help me to help others get on the right path or stay on the right path. <clears throat> so imagine for a second if you had no direction, and if you had no purpose, and these verses did not exist, or you did not know of them. Then what would, you, then what would your purpose be? How could, how could it really be anything different than what you see and read on TV or on your phone? How could it be with so much out there to, you know, the information overload? That it'd be more like every direction. I have every direction. I have every purpose. I, how would you even decide? But thanks be to God that we have a purpose. I think, and I think for that, that particular one, um, those of us who are lifelong Christians we can lose perspective sometimes, right? I mean, it's like we don't re hardly know what it would be like to not have a purpose, you know? Um, and so we need to do stop and think about that sometimes, you know? And just think about what our life would be like that. And then, whew, it's like, no thanks. I'm glad I got a purpose, even if it keeps me kind of busy. So now, next thing we've got, we've got a, a direct line to God via the Holy Spirit. Because you put on Jesus in baptism, which gifted you with the Holy Spirit. And so that allows you to do this. And Romans 8.15 tells us that. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. We cry, we cry, Daddy. You know, we're able to call Him Father. We're able to be close to Him and directly with Him. We also, we also have a clear conscience. Man, this is a great one. Your mistakes are erased. Your sin is gone and forgiven. And you could say, your poop doesn't stink about your sins anyway to God because, you know, you mess up. You make mistakes. And what does it say? You know, God has removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. I mean, you can't, you know, it, he just doesn't, he doesn't recognize it. It's gone. That's just, the, that's just how it is. Okay. Hebrews 9.14, how much more than with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. See, your conscience needs to be clean. Yeah, because Jesus took care of it. It's paid. It's paid. It's gone. 1 Peter 3.21, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A clear conscience towards God. Do you believe what the Bible says? I ask again. It says you have a clear conscience with God. You're forgiven and righteous in God's eyes. Okay, another one. Got to keep moving. Coverage by Jesus' grace and power in discouraging circumstances or when you just feel like you are not enough. Anybody ever feel like you're just not enough? No, it never strikes me. It never crosses my path. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, this is Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why. 
For Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. God's got you. Whenever there are hardships, difficulties, bad health, lack of money, lack of power, those things the prosperity gospel will give you, the same God has you covered. And you go, well, wow, it makes me want to go right here. Hey, what happened to health, wealth, and power? Paul must not have had enough faith. Otherwise, he would have, or maybe should have given more to somebody's ministry, and then he would have had all the health, wealth, and things. Yeah, but he didn't. He, had, he was praying about a health he was praying for a health thing here, right, when he said that. We don't know for sure what it is. Maybe that's so we wouldn't make too big a deal of it. I don't know. But we don't know, and there's ideas. But he's just saying, hey, God's got this. And, and I may have those things, but God's still got that. <clears throat> and that's just, not how, that's just not how this works, you know. Jesus says, hey, that's not how this works. The way it works is that you're going to have. We looked last week at verses that say, you know, we are going to have weaknesses. We're going to have hardships. We're going to have persecutions and difficulties. And it's God's grace that makes up for the physical weaknesses as well as the spiritual. So, I need to bring this in for a landing. Hopefully it goes better than Mr. Duck. Okay, so I am not kidding you. I have about 15 more, but I'm not going to put you through that. I'm literally 15 more. If you want the list, I'll give them. Actually, I'm going to list the list, but just the list. We're not going to cover them. Okay, so two slides of them, actually. All these others, contentment, a hope and longing for a better place. These are all things promised in Scripture. They're all things told us promise isn't the right word. They're just stated. This is what you have. Receiving a hundred times what you sacrificed for in, in, for Jesus in this life. In this life, it says. Confidence, truth and honesty, competence, boldness, more. A perfect example to imitate. Answers to life. A seat at the table in heaven next to Jesus. Already. You actually already have that. I was dying to get to that verse, but we don't have time. Faith. You have something to believe in. Freedom from judgment by others' standards, you know, by the standards of others, you know, by the judgment by the world. Inward renewal day by day. And I think, wow, you know, all those things are so great. If I believe what the Bible says, I, that's what I've got. And what we did cover, we covered, you, we had already covered today. You have hope in the future, freedom from enslaving sin, recovery of blindness to the truth, freedom from the oppression of sin that's holding you back, enjoyment of being in the year of the Lord's favor, and peace that transcends understanding, oh, and more, a purpose, and connection straight to God via the Holy Spirit, a clear conscience, and covered by God in, in all discouraging situations. But... And you should be feeling like this. Oh yeah, victory in Christ. But, I, I'm not, uh, well, but what if you're here? What if after all these things, what if after all these things, you know, you, I'm like, well, I, I would like to be sitting there feeling like, man, let's go out there, we have victory in Jesus. And what if you're not feeling it? It's important that I don't just leave you hanging in that state if that's where you are at the moment. That's my job, to help. I want to help you figure this out so you can be victorious, so that you can be prosperous in Jesus, and that your relationship with God is working. That's my job. Or, or at least, even if it's true, that saying, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I, at a minimum, have the responsibility as an elder, and after waving in front of you all these wonderful things, to lead you to the water and to help you figure out what you can do to feel the prosperity. So let's quickly, there's a lot of possibilities uh, for the prosperity ruiners. So here's a list of prosperity ruiners, ruiners and how to get rid of them. That's how we're going to land here. Okay, so one, maybe you aren't a Christian. Well, that would explain it. These are all things that a Christian has. You don't have them if you're not a Christian. If you haven't decided to stop trying to do life on your own terms and make Jesus your Lord and let the Word of God run all your big moral decisions, sorry, you won't have it. Or if you're just pretending 
Stop torturing yourself. Stop sitting on the fence and get in already. Now, as much as ever, consider this. As much as ever in the world around us, down is up and up is down morally. In the world, due to a mass ignoring the wisdom of God and what these verses say. Society used to compare new thoughts that would come along about morality with the Bible. And now they don't as much. And it's causing mayhem. So don't be surprised if you're out there and you're not in Christ that you can't have true prosperity like that. Okay, we can help you. Come see me after. Come see one of the, grab, find one of the elders. Let's look in the word that gives eternal life. And these prosperities can be yours. Okay, secondly, Christian, is the world watching, stealing your joy? And I don't mean the world watching you. Maybe watching the world destroy itself around us is stealing your joy. Maybe you're watching it too closely. Maybe you're letting society, the decline in morality and politics, take up too much of your space in your mind and heart. Maybe you're spending too much time watching news and news commentary instead of being in the Word or with someone helping them spiritually or some helping somebody to come to or come back to Jesus. Hmm? Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe you're holding back from a full commitment. Are you holding back from fully committing or recommitting and being all in in your Christianity? Maybe Jesus just stopped calling the shots somewhere along the way in your household. You know, Peter said to the people at Pentecost, that we've got to be all in. Here's how, he, here's how he said that. So he says there in Acts chapter 2 that God made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Savior. Yes, he was the Messiah, the Savior, there to take away all your sins. Definitely to do that. But he was also to be their king, their master, their boss, their Lord. That's why Paul reminded them in the, in the Romans, just happens to mention kind of in passing, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. He's got to be the boss, right? He's the Lord. If you declare that he's your Lord, then you're, call, you're saying he's your boss, or he's not. For the prosperities to be felt, he has to be the Lord, the Lord of your life. That's the only way it's really going to work. So if you're not fully committed or recommitted to being all in, it just isn't going to work that way. And maybe you have like, kind of like one foot in and one foot out. So, so try this. For a couple months, try the Matthew 6.33 challenge, I call it. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You know? Engage, you know? Jump in for a few months. Engage, Maverick. Engage! You know? Plug in. Jump in. Try it. Volunteer. You know? Jump in. Okay, next. Have you limited how much of the Bible you'll obey? It's getting more popular and popular today. More popular and popular today. More and more popular today. It's become a big thing. But when James, a person blessed by God, he says this, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Hmm. I mean, that's what we ought to do. Or maybe you're just grinding it out. I'm going to move along here. So maybe you're just grinding out, running only on your commitment, kind of, le kind of legalistic, you know. Sometimes a, a long, lifelong Christian or somebody born in the church, we can go along observing the law, knowing a lot of Bible. But still we're not enjoying it. Why aren't I enjoying it? I ought to be enjoying it. <laughs> well, I think the solution for you there is you need to count your blessings. You need to count, count the fact that you're going to heaven, first of all, which was one of our very basic things. And since you're a good Bible verse follower, because that's what you are, you're, you're a person who's running on your commitment, you're a good, you're a good Bible keeper, you're, you're not, you don't sin much, you know, kind of thing. It just means, since you're decisive, that means you've got some self-discipline. And so what you need to do with that is just remember, your ticket's punched, and it's only a decision away for you. Name it, claim it. Name it and claim it. Name that happiness and claim it. Don't let it be wrecking your life. Um, maybe you don't feel appreciated for the sacrifice and work that you are doing. Sometimes we get weary, weary of doing the work. And I'm doing the work. Why isn't anything happening? Or maybe I you know, don't feel like everybody around me is on fire for the Lord or something. So Paul himself was in chains, and he said this to Timothy, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation 
that is in Christ Jesus the, with eternal glory. <clears throat> you know, you too, if that's, if that's you, you're enduring everything to help others that are seeking with all their heart. You're a lifeline for them, and God knows it. Try to feel good about that. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. Paul talks about we're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. You know, you're a hero if you're doing that. You're being like Jesus. You're feeling what he, what he was tempted to feel, that's for sure, but he didn't let it get him down. Because he knew his ticket was punched, too. He knew the Father loved him and he was doing Dad's work. Don't quit. Run to the battle. Let these words encourage you and comfort you. Lastly, maybe you're hiding sin. Maybe the reason you can't get those things is because there's some you're living in sin, as we might say, or practicing a sin, and it's eating your lunch. Eating your, eating your lunch. So... Is it really to be better miserable keeping your sin in the dark than, than letting it out in the light and feel right with God? If the Bible's true, Acts 3.19 tells us that when we, when we repent, times of refreshing come. Hmm, then maybe we'd feel better if I got rid of that. And it's like when you have the flu and you feel like you got to throw up, and you're, if you're one of those people that's like me, like, I can be nauseated for three days. I can handle it. I'm not going to throw up, you know. Now, what the problem with that is you usually feel better, right, after you throw up. And maybe we just need to do that. Maybe what's, what's, what's nauseating your faith needs to just be thrown up. Are you doing that? Maybe that's the answer. <clears throat> and the way we get in that funk is explained in John 3. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Our pride, we all want to look good. You know, our pride keeps us from doing that. We're all tempted to hide it. And then we don't get the peace and the joy and the confidence and all the other, you know, 20 or so things that are prosperities of being a Christian. And if you need to, so how do you get rid of that? The three easy payments, I mean, steps. James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then these other, the next two steps are right there. James 4, 17, submit yourself to God and then resist the devil and he'll free from you. Man, just don't let it get you. So, so, okay. So those are the prosperity ruiners. I'm not going to read back through them. You got it. Hey, if one of these is you, let's fix it. Let's get together. Let's help you. Help you. We'll talk about it. We'll study about it. We'll pray through it. We'll get you on the right path. If you're not a Christian, we'll help you get, help you get there. Because um, you should be here and my goal is for you to be here I don't want you to be here so don't be here and you can come forward now if you need to or approach one of the elders after and we'll be more than eager to get started getting you away from there and to here let's stand as we sing <clears throat>